My name's Rose. I've been mushroom foraging for a number of years now. I started foraging for mushrooms because I became fascinated about the medicinal benefits of certain mushrooms. I then became interested in the mushrooms that I could possibly eat, not to mention becoming awed by the beauty of many of them. Today I'm going to try to demystify mushroom foraging for you, share essential information and share stories of my own journey. Alright, let's get into it. Foraging for mushrooms is more than just walking into the woods and picking what looks good. It's about understanding the world underneath our feet, knowing where to look, when to look, and most importantly, what to avoid. Foraging should be a fun and exciting experience, but it should never become a risky or dangerous one. Simply don't put yourself under pressure to try and eat something that you're not 100% sure of. Believe me, the more you get outside and study mushrooms, the more confidence you're going to get, and it really doesn't need to be a rushed process. Firstly, if you want to get into mushroom foraging, I would recommend focusing on one, maybe two mushrooms that you'd ideally like to find. For me, the mushroom that I was most aware of and intrigued in finding was the chanterelle. For me, it was a good one because it's quite a unique looking mushroom and was allegedly quite tasty. I recommend you do something similar. Study the attributes of a couple of mushrooms, learn them really well and focus. Once you've decided on what you want to find, you need to understand when to go out and look for it. If you're looking for a mushroom like the sep, also known as the porcini, there's no point in looking in the middle of the winter or early spring. This particular mushroom will generally grow in the summer to autumn time. The seasons are really important and will save you loads of disappointment. September through to October is pretty much when the ground and the trees are awash with fungi, but there are certain types that will pop out later, like the jelly ear or the velvet shank, both of them edible. What the weather is doing will also be key, so sometimes it's going to take a few outings to find what you're after. Certain types of mushroom can grow really quickly. You won't see any indication of them one day, and the next day they'll be huge. Now you've narrowed down your focus to a couple of mushrooms and you understand when you need to go out looking, the next major thing you need to understand and narrow down is the habitat that your target mushrooms grow in. Some mushrooms grow on trees, others in fields, others in woods, then the game changer that really boosts your chance of success is knowing if your mushroom favours particular trees. Certain mycorrhizal fungi form mutually beneficial partnerships with trees. They consume carbon from the trees and provide nitrogen, phosphorus and other minerals back. The point here is that mushrooms tend to favour certain types of trees. The penny bun, for example, is typically found in mixed forests of birch, beech, oak, pine, spruce and fir. I've had particular success with birch, beech and oak. I can't stress how much of a game changer this was for me. I spent hours and hours looking for penny buns when I started out, with absolutely no success. When I learned the types of trees I should be looking for first, it increased my success dramatically. Finally, this one may seem obvious, but does it grow on trees, around trees, only on dead trees? Learning your trees is really key. Luckily you don't need to learn them all, just learn the ones that your chosen fungi are fond of. Before we start looking at the different types of mushrooms, it would be awesome and a big favour to me if you could smash that like button. It really does help massively in getting this video out to more people. Thank you. Now that we've got all the macro bases covered, it's time to get to grips with what the mushroom looks like. There are many different types of mushrooms with a plethora of different characteristics, but let's try to simplify it and break it down. Your, let's say, traditional looking mushroom with a cap and a stem comes in loads of different shapes and sizes, but one of the biggest defining differences is what is underneath the cap. You're going to have gills, pretend gills, what I like to call wrinkles, pores or spines, also known as teeth. Let's look at some of the gilled mushrooms first. Gilled mushrooms are what most people picture when they think of a mushroom. These gills are thin, papery structures radiating outwards from the stem and what the mushroom uses to release its spores into the environment so it can reproduce. When examining gilled mushrooms, pay close attention to the colour, spacing and attachments of the gills. These features can be vital clues in identification. 
For example, some mushrooms have gills that attach directly to the stem in a variety of different ways. Some don't attach to the stem at all, and some run down the stem, which is known as decurrent. Spacing can feel quite subjective, but as an example, this amethyst deceiver would be considered to be having wide spacing, whilst this yellow swamp rosula is quite close. Next up, pored mushrooms. These have a sponge-like feature on the underside of the cap. If you cross-section the cap, you'll see that the pores are ends of tubes, which are what the mushroom uses to release its spores. One of the most renowned porous mushrooms is the sep, which is in the Boletus family. These mushrooms are many a forager's dream, including mine, and were the second mushroom I ever foraged for food. Another one of my favourites for its medicinal properties is the birch polypore. This only grows on birch trees and is also porous. Now we have mushrooms that have gill-like looking structures, but are actually more like wrinkles. The chanterelle, or even the winter chanterelle, are classic examples of this, as you see here. When it comes to toothed mushrooms, there really aren't that many that you're going to come across. The two key ones are the hedgehog and terracotta hedgehog fungi. You see how they don't have gills or pores, but these teeth-like looking structures that hang down? Not many others are going to look like these. OK, now we're sorted on the time of year, the habitat and the cap. Now let's understand some of the different characteristics of the stem, also known as the stipe to the fungi bods amongst us. This feature of a mushroom, or lack of, is just as important as the cap, as it can hold key identifying clues. Firstly, they can be slender or even graceful like the chanterelle, or big and robust like some of the bolets. The texture of the stem is also important. Is it smooth or perhaps flexed like this brown birch bolet? In the case of the king bolet, it has what's called a reticulum, which is a fishnet-like white feature at the top of the stem. Is it solid? Does it snap almost like chalk? A giveaway for the Rasula family. Does the mushroom even have a stem? Oyster mushrooms, for example, sometimes look like they don't have a stem or is very short and stubby. Does the stem have a ring or annulus? If it does, pay close attention to the features of the ring. Some rings in the Amanita family, for example, can have striations, whilst others like the deadly panther cap are pretty smooth. Others, like in the parasol family, have rings that you can easily move up and down the stem. Now the base of the stem. Is it bulbous? Is it slender? Does it bruise a different colour to the rest of it? Does it grow out of a vulva, a cup-like structure in the ground? This can be key in identifying certain members of the Amanita family. Now let's take a look at spore prints. The mushrooms that I foraged for myself are pretty recognisable by all the features we just went through, but taking a spore print can be a useful confirmation. To do a spore print, simply take a fairly mature cap place it on some glass or a clear plastic, put a drop of water on the cap and cover it overnight. You should get a nice drop of spores and be able to discern the colour of them. Most good books will describe the shape and the colour of the spores for you. So this can be a great way to give you a final confirmation if you need it, but never just use a spore print, use it in combination with all other features. Which brings me to the book that I've used and found the most useful. Mushrooms by Roger Phillips. For anyone starting out, especially if you're in the UK or Europe, but there'll certainly be a lot of crossover in other parts of the world like the US and Canada too. This book is really good because it gives you a really detailed description of the mushroom that you're after, including the spore prints. When it comes to picking, you get lots of different views as to whether you should cut the stem or not. I read in one paper that it stated it didn't really matter all that much, and they found that in this particular study, when they pulled up the stem, it signalled to the mycelium to spur new growth. But even this study stated that there really wasn't much in it. I tend to pull the mushrooms up when in the ground, but sometimes cut them when they're on trees, so I don't end up yanking half the tree along with it. Remember, fungi aren't just for us. Many animals, insects, slugs and all sorts rely on fungi as a food source, so don't go picking everything you see. No hard and fast rules here, but just be mindful of what you take. So the biggest takeaways of today are to really focus on a couple of varieties, learn them well and simply don't eat anything that you're not absolutely sure of. There really is no upside to doing it and bravery should never even enter the equation. Remember though to enjoy the journey. I certainly don't know all the mushrooms there are out there but it's really fun building the knowledge. I'd love to hear your thoughts in this video. Drop me a comment below and let me know if you did find it useful or maybe you've got your own tips and tricks up your sleeves and you'd like to share them with the community. If you found this video useful, it would go a long way if you could hit that like button and do subscribe to see more. Happy foraging!